clearly, many of you know John personally or from his writing. And so I'd like to introduce John a little bit differently tonight, the way he introduces each chapter in his account of the 96 Everest tragedy uh, into, the, into thin air. And that is with a quote. Um, I've been on Everest myself, and I've written a book of my own about it. And so I can tell you from experience that every writer taking a stab at Everest hopes that he or she is finally, at long last, writing the next Moby Dick. The parallels are all there. A team of comrades, a journey, ropes, cold steel, high winds, the big white one. Not least of all is the resonance, an adventurer setting off upon a quest that is about to become a great epic. If John did not have Moby Dick in mind when he sat down to write this classic, I think it's fair to say that Herman Melville had something like Into Thin Air in mind when he sat down uh, to write this opening paragraph. <laughs> Call me Ishmael. <laughs> whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, grisly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my hypos get such an upper hand on me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from knocking people's hats off, then I account it high time to get to sea or to the mountain. Please welcome John Krakauer. Um, thanks very much for coming. Thanks to Jeff. You guys don't know that, but Jeff was actually one of my main inspirations when I became a freelance writer. He was actually one of the first writers I knew who actually wrote for a living, and he's a, a wonderful writer. Um, he wrote this thing called uh, Soloist Diary. Was that what it was called? Way back when, and he doesn't, he's, we've had this debate before. He, doesn't like it anymore, apparently, but I think it's a great thing. It was published in Ascent long ago, but that was one of the most inspiring things I ever read. Um, thanks also to the, to the Boulder Library for letting us have this hall and to the Boulder Bookstore for inviting me here. Um, and without further delay, if we could turn the lights out. Um, as, uh, as almost everyone knows, um, Everest was first climbed 44 years ago, just a, 44 years ago, just a few days ago. In 1953, by Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay. Um, that was a year before I was born, so I missed it. But um, 10 years later, an event I remember well. Uh, in 1963, Americans climbed Everest for the first time. And this was a huge event all across America. I mean, it was in the cover of Life magazine and National Geographic, and it made a huge impact on me. Um, this, Americans climbed the mountain three times on that expedition, and one of the ascents was the first ascent of the West Ridge, which at the time was one of the hardest climbs ever done in the history of mountaineering, and is still considered one of the greatest ascents of all time, perhaps one of the five greatest ascents of all time. The two guys who, who made that climb were uh, Willie Unsold, who was a professor of theology from Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon, which was my hometown, and Tom Hornbein, who was a, a doctor from St. Louis. And when they got back, Hornbein wrote this book, Everest the West Ridge, uh, it's one of the classics of mountaineering literature. It's a much better book than my book, and anyone who hasn't read it, I would urge you to. It's still in print by the Mountaineers. I, I bet the Boulder Bookstore has a copy or could get you a copy. Um, this is a copy I bought, probably the second copy I bought when I was a teenager. It cost three ninety five dollars back then. Books were cheaper. Um, it's all dog-eared in coffee stain because I've read it more than a, a dozen times. Uh, it made a huge impact on me. Um, one of the reasons it had made such an impact was Unsold, the guy who made the first, one of the guys who made the first ascent of that climb was a close friend of my father's, and I grew up with his kids, Debbie and Regan, who are a year older and a year younger than me. And um, my father taught me to climb when I was eight years old in the Cascade Range of Oregon. The first summit I ever reached was with my father and Unsold and his son, Regan. So that's where the seeds of my dream to climb Everest began, um, every, when I was nine years old. And it was, a, you know, as I say, it, it really lodged hard in my imagination. Now, my father, there's five kids in my family. You can see my siblings. This uh, is my brother, Andrew, affectionately known as Porco, who's here tonight with his wife and daughter, by the way. And my father taught all of us to climb. Um, but for some reason, 
my siblings liked it well enough, but it never really got under their skin like it did mine, and they went on to lead normal, productive lives. <laughs> and uh, I grew up to be a climber. This is a picture taken <laughs> when I was, I think I was 20. This is 1974. Um, and uh, by this point, um, climbing was all I cared about. I mean, everything else was a distant second. And that same year that this picture was taken, in 74, I went to Alaska for the first time. And this is what really pushed me over the edge as far as climbing went. This is where I went. This is the Aragetch Peaks in, in the high Arctic. It's, in, it's what's now gates of the Arctic National Park, but then in 74 there was no national park. It hadn't been created yet. It was just wilderness. And uh, I, you know, I was amazed and dumbstruck to realize that Alaska is full of beautiful unclimbed mountains like this. These, almost every mountain in this picture, with the exception of that one, had been, had been, hadn't been climbed. And a friend, Bill Bullard, and I made the first ascent of this mountain. It's called, officially known as 7190. The climbers call it Xanadu. And the route begins, there's a lower part of the face you can't see, then across these ledges, and it climbs this skyline ridge. Now, I'd been climbing since I was eight, 12 years when I did this. But most of that climb had been on easy volcanoes in the west. And I'd only been rock climbing for two years. So I wasn't a good climber. I could, for those of you who are climbers, I could, when I went to Alaska, I could only climb 5'8", five, 5'9", five, on a good day which show, goes to show you that you don't have to be a great climber to have cool adventures. You just sort of have to have the desire and, and imagination. This route is no harder than 5'8", if that. It's, but it's beautiful. It hasn't, it's never been, this mountain's never been climbed since in those, whatever, 25 years, 23 years. So, um, This is the summit of that mountain, Xanadu. Two in the morning. Um, it's the Arctic, so in the summer the sun never sets. It just circles the horizon and you get this amazing light. It's like a narcotic. And, I remember this moment vividly. It was as happy as I'd ever been in my life. Um, you know, after this, there was nothing. With, you know, climbing was everything. There was no going back. I mean, nothing could touch this. So I came back to, this, to the lower 48, and I worked hard on my rock climbing. Um, I got, decided to be, try to become as good as I could get at rock climbing. Um, in the mid-'70s, when I lived in Boulder, um, I lived here for four years, from 76 until 80, um, I taught myself to ice climb. This is on the designator. In, rigid designator in Vail, probably in 77. Um, and this was, those of you who were around then, this was a real exciting time to be an ice climber because, you know, Chouinard, Yvonne Chouinard, the guy who owns Patagonia now, had just, not that many years earlier, revolutionized the sport by putting a curve in the ice axe, and so everything was wide open. It, people, you know, Jeff Lowe had just climbed Bridal Bell Falls for the first time, he and Weiss um, two years earlier. So people were just learning how to do vertical and overhanging ice, so it was an exciting time to be ice climbing. Every chance I went to Canada, this is uh, my friend Pam Brown, who lives in Boulder now, um, on the summit of, I think, Pigeon Spire in the Bugaboos in British Columbia. Um, better yet, I went to Alaska uh, every summer that I could. Um, this is 75. Um, this is the Alaska Range. Mount McKinley, Denali, the highest mountain in the continent. This is a ridge of Denali. It rises off the picture there. This is Mount Huntington, Mount Dickey. We're on the summit of a mountain. This is my friend Tom Davies on the summit of a mountain. We christened Mount Cosmic Debris. We just made the first ascent. No one's heard of it or cares about it, but it was a, it was a good climb. Um, in 76, I moved to Boulder because um, of the climbing. And uh, I met a guy in the aristocrat restaurant who gave me a job as a, carp as a carpenter. And I had, there was no tables empty, and he had a spot, so I sat down. And by the end of breakfast, uh, he talked me into spending 300 bucks on tools, and he gave me a job. And for the next eight years, I was a carpenter. And it was a good job for a climber because you could, I could build a house um, down in Broomfield or later here in Boulder. And it'd take about three months, and then I could earn enough money to climb for four or five months, and I'd build another house. And uh, you know, I worked for Mike Kinsing here in Boulder. I worked for Markel Holmes. Um, some of my guys I work with are still here. Um, in '77, when I was living in Boulder, I was living in a construction trailer down on Spruce Street when I was building the Spruce Street townhouses. Um, I got it into my head to attempt this mountain. This is the Devil's Thumb on the border between Southeast Alaska and British Columbia. This is the northwest face of the Devil's Thumb. That's 6,000 vertical feet. That's twice the height of El Cap in Yosemite. It had never been climbed. It's still never been climbed. Uh, it's been attempted a lot. Uh, <laughs> Mike, Mike Biarzi here in Boulder uh, has attempted this. He's sort of the, this is his wall, and he's tried it before, and if it ever gets climbed, he's going to be the guy who tries it. Just last month, in April, it was attempted by Alex Lowe, who was probably the best climber in the world right now, and, and Randy Ratcliffe, who's another superb climber from Jackson, New Hampshire. Randy, in addition to being a great climber, is the guy who made those woodcuts in my book and Into Thin Air. I think they're amazing woodcuts, and he's 
remarkable artist. But I didn't, I decided not to attempt this face. I was going to attempt this rib, uh, a considerably easier route. And for reasons that were, seemed very clear at the time but are no longer clear, I decided to do this alone. So in the <laughs> spring of 77, I drove my, I drove my Pontiac Star Chief, uh, $100 Pontiac, from Boulder to uh, the Seattle area, Puget Sound. I left it by the side of the road, and I hitched north on this boat. This is the Ocean Queen, a 58-foot salmon saner. Um, just took turns at the wheel, and they gave me a free ride. And three days later, they dropped me off in Petersburg, Alaska, a little fishing village. From saltwater, I skied up this glacier alone, 30 miles up to the horizon. That's this Dakin ice cap, um, big ice sheet. And there, I was at the base of the thumb. Now, the Devil's Thumb is it's bad weather in this part of Alaska most of the time, which means the walls plastered with ice, which is what allows you to climb it. But um, you have to pick your days to climb. And hadn't been there long before I got a clear day, so I started to, I went for it, started to climb. It's hard to tell what's going on in this picture, but this is vertical ice right to the left of that rib I showed you. Um, I'm hanging off one axe and shooting down between my legs with the camera. This is my left boot. This is the rope hanging down into space um, that I carried to rappel down with. I didn't belay, I just third classed it because that was good ice. It was soft and thick here. Um, and it was actually quite reasonable. I felt good on this, but five or six hundred feet higher, the ice got thin and weird and funky, and I got frightened. Uh, it turned into rhyme, and I came down. I tried it again a few days later in a slightly different place, didn't even get as high, came down again. But I really wanted to climb this peak because it's a beautiful mountain any way you get to the top. So I skied around to the other side, the southeast face, which is this side. And on a nice afternoon, again, I waited for the weather, and I climbed halfway up, and I pitched my tent right here um, on this promontory, which is a spectacular place to camp. I, I had to stop there because, uh, because the ice, it was afternoon, and it was the sunny side of the mountain, so it, the ice was getting soft and coming down. So I waited. I spent the night there. Next morning, I got up at dawn, and the climbing was much easier on this side. It's not as steep, and these ice, it's south-facing, so it freezes and thaws, and the ice is really good here. So I didn't even carry a rope this attempt. I just third class up these, uh, connected these ice patches. And uh, in very short order, I didn't have a watch, but it must have only been a couple hours because it was easy. I got to the summit. And I knew my buddies back here in Boulder would never believe I actually climbed the thumb if I didn't take this picture. This is the actual summit. It's a very, it's a very narrow ridge, and it's sort of scary the last little bit. But um, this is the summit. Now, this, by the way, is Mount Burkett, another beautiful mountain in the Stikine, hardly ever been climbed. This is Burkett Needle, which is the cover of Climbing Magazine this month. Um, and it's a wonderful climb. Some friends of mine climbed that face just a couple years ago. So after I took this picture, I turned around and I down climbed because I never rope. Got back to my skis, skied back to the ocean. And uh, after a day or two, a boat came by and I flagged it down and I went home. <laughs> now, in many ways, this was the start of my writing career. Um, these climbs, I'd never studied writing, and I was a very bad student. I barely graduated from college. I very, barely graduated from high school. I actually didn't really graduate from high school. And, um, but Climbing Magazine started asking me to write about them, and um, this was actually the first article I ever got paid for, a, climb, a magazine called Mountain that's now defunct, unfortunately. It's kind of a cool magazine. It paid me 35 pounds, about 70 bucks, and I was off and running, and I was, I was so excited. I mean, I don't think I've ever been more excited on any check I've gotten since, except for since I got this. Now, I'd had some real close scrapes on the thumb. I mean, I'd almost gotten killed a couple times, three, four times, and I'd wake, over the next few years, I'd wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat thinking about that. And I looked around at my friends who went to college with, and they were, you know, they were becoming lawyers and doctors and having families and buying furniture and stuff, and I was, I was living in a construction trailer on Spruce Street, you know, so I decided it was time to get serious about life, and I decided to quit climbing. Um, in 1980, I took a job on the boat that gave me a ride to Alaska in 77, the Ocean Queen, on the back deck. It was good money. Um, I was going to make a stake and get on with life. And that summer, my girlfriend at the time, Linda Moore, came up on the boat. This is her on, on the Ocean Queen. And it was a romantic thing to do, and we got along. And when I told her I was going to quit climbing and get serious about life, she agreed to marry me. This was a big factor in her decision to marry me. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I didn't, under, I didn't appreciate it. The, the pull the mountains had on me. Um, places like this, Pat Patagonia. This is, you know, Pat Fitzroy down in Patagonia. And so I, I started climbing again. I make light of it, but it was actually, as many of you know who climb, it's not easy to have a partner who doesn't climb if you do. But we've been married now almost 17 years, so we've worked it out. It's still an issue. But 
Uh, the thing that really, the thing that really, uh, the thing that really, we almost got divorced over this climb. This is, this is, in 1984, I went to the north face of the Arger with Mark Twight, who lives here in town. He's a friend of mine. This is Mark uh, at the end of the Hinterstoiser Traverse coming up after me. And this climb almost cost me my marriage. We didn't get up the climb, but my marriage held on. Um, and after that, I started writing full time. Actually, just before that, right, in 83. And I was inspired by, <clears throat> I knew a couple writers. Jeff Long and Dave Roberts um, were doing this. Jim Baylog was doing this as a photographer. He lives in town. This, this is a Boulder connection, because Jeff lives here, Jim lives here. Dave Roberts, pictured here, uh, who was my main mentor, grew up in Boulder. His mother and sister are here in the audience tonight. His, his mother uh, had a lot to do with the creation of this library. Um, so David became my friend and mentor, and he convinced me you could make a living at writing. So I started writing full time in 83. Um, and now I was getting paid to do stuff like climb the South Bay on El Cap. You know, it was, I thought I'd gone to heaven. Um, Outside Magazine said, you know, this is where you want to do. I got to climb with some of my heroes. This is Yvonne Chouinard, uh, the father of, you know, ice climbing in a certain sense. And, you know, Chouinard's never going to climb with the likes of me unless I'm writing about him. But I got to uh, climb with him because I was writing about him. This is in Highlight Canyon up in Bozeman. Um, in 1984, one of the best assignments I ever got was I went to what was then East Germany, Dresden, East Germany. Here are these amazing sandstone towers. And I went with this guy. This is Fritz Wiesner. <laughs> Um, Fritz is one of the great climbers of all time. Reinhold Messner, if you ask him who are his heroes, who are his role models, Fritz is first on the list. Fritz and Walter Bonatti. Um, you know, Fritz passed the torch from, from Wiesner to Bonatti to Messner. And this is Wiesner. He's a, he's a legend. When he took me to Dresden, he was 84 years old. In this photo, he's 84. He could climb as good or better than me at the age of 84, and I was 30. He's a real inspiration to me. He died two years later, sadly, but I was, I was honored that I got to climb with him, and I never would have if I wasn't a writer. Um, I was writing full time now. Um, I couldn't make a living just writing about climbing the outdoors, so half the stuff I wrote was about art or pol political science or whatever, culture for Smithsonian or Rolling Stone, whoever would pay me. Um, but the outdoors stuff was always the nearest and dearest to my heart, and no article has affected me more than the one I wrote about this kid. This is Chris McCandless. Uh, I wrote a book about him later, Into the Wild, and uh, McCandless grew up in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. He was every parent's dream kid, uh, a brilliant student, a gifted athlete. He was real idealistic, though, and real kind of cocky, and he thought he knew everything, like many young people do, and um, his idealism was such, um, he read too much, he read way too much Tolstoy. He, he, in high school, in high school he, had, he seriously wanted to go to South Africa and join the armed struggle to end apartheid, which is still in effect then. And he had to be talked out of it. Um, he wanted to smuggle arms. This is an intense kid, you know, and his parents were concerned, but he seemed to, he didn't get in trouble. And he went to Emory University in Atlanta. He was an honor student there. He graduated in June of 1990, and his parents came down to Atlanta for the graduation. Everything seemed fine. He told them he'd see him again in a couple months. Well, then they didn't hear from him. So in August, they drove back down to Atlanta to visit him. And they found a for rent sign in the window. And he was gone. He dropped completely off the radar. Turned out, to their horror, that he'd given away a $25,000 trust fund to charity. He changed his name from Chris McCandless to Alexander Supertramp. He had driven out west and abandoned his car. Um, and then, in a gesture that his hero Tolstoy would have understood and appreciated, he took, after giving away this trust fund, he took the last cash in his wallet here, put it on the desert floor beside Lake Mead in Arizona, and lit it on fire and burned it up. And he took this picture of it, July 10th, 1990. You can see the date on his little Minolta. Um, he took a lot of pictures and journals, which is why, how we know much of what we know about Chris. After he burned up his money, for the next two years, he wandered around the West, living on nothing, sleeping in the dirt, having a great adventure, hanging out with drifters and winos and bums, all of which was preparation for what he considered his greatest adventure. In um, April of 1992, he hitchhiked a lot to Alaska to live off the land, completely off the land. He wanted to hike into the wilderness and live off the land for six, seven, eight months. Right before he left for Alaska, he'd been down in South Dakota, Madison and Carthage, South Dakota, working at a grain elevator to get a little grub steak uh, for this guy, Wayne Westerberg, a, a guy he met on the road. And when he got to Fairbanks, he wrote Westerberg this postcard. It reads, greetings from Fairbanks. This is the last you shall hear from me, Wayne. Arrived here two days ago. It was very difficult to catch rides in the Yukon Territory, but I finally got here. Please return all mail I received to the sender. It might be a very long time before I return south. 
If this adventure proves fatal and you don't ever hear from me again, I want you to know you are a great man. I now walk into the wild, Alex. The day after he sent that postcard, he hitched south out of Fairbanks on the George Parks Highway to the edge of Denali National Park. Um, the guy who gave him a ride, Jim Galleon, took this picture of him on, on, on McCandless's camera. Um, now, McCandless is going to be living off the land for seven or eight months, and he's not caring much. He's an idealist. He's looking for a real challenge. He really wants to test himself. And in his mind, in his idealism, any challenge that you know you're going to succeed at isn't really a challenge at all. You know, what's the point? So the only food he's carrying is a 10-pound bag of rice for backup. In his pack, all he's got is a sleeping bag and about a dozen paperback books, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Henry David Thoreau. Um, he's got a 22 caliber rifle over his shoulder, five boxes of shells. Then after he got his camera back from Gallon, he turned around and hiked to these mountains in the background, the outer ranges of the Alaska Range. Um, Four days down the trail, he arrived at this bus. Now, I took this picture the first time I visited the bus in July, but when the canvas got there the 1st of May or the 2nd of May, it was still wintry and snow on the ground. And it's, it's, yeah, I knew the bus was there, and it's still a total freak out to come across it. It's so incongruous. It doesn't have an engine or anything. It had been towed back there one winter behind a, a D5 Caterpillar by a bunch of hunters. You know, these are Alaskans, so they thought it would be a cool idea to tow this bus back there to use as a, a shelter. They were moose hunters, and they wanted a shelter. so they towed this bus 30 miles from the highway so they could use it every fall when moose season opened. And McCandless was thrilled to find it. Uh, in his journal, he called it the magic bus. It had a stove inside there, a wood stove, and a couple of bunks. And he moved in and made it his base camp. You can tell how excited he was to be there by this graffito. He wrote this on a piece of plywood covering a, one of the broken windows in the bus. And it begins, he wrote this probably a day or two after he got there, maybe the first day. It begins with an ode to a Roger Miller song that he liked, King of the Road. It begins, two years he walks the earth, no phone, no pool, no pets, no cigarettes, ultimate freedom, an extremist, an aesthetic voyager whose home is the road, escape from Atlanta, thou shalt not return, because the West is the best, and now, after two rambling years, comes the final and greatest adventure, the climactic battle to kill the false being within and victoriously conclude this spiritual revolution. Ten days and nights of freight trains and hitching brings them to the great white north, no longer to be poisoned by civilization, he flees and walks alone upon the land to become lost in the wild. Alexander Supertramp, May 1992. I've been to the bus three times now, most recently last fall. I, I, I can't get the kid out of my head. Um, even after the book's done, I'm still fascinated with him. And his, his presence is still all over that bus. Um, the first time I went there, I found this. This is a crown to his molar. He, I know it's what it is because in his journal he mentions losing it. And it must have been really painful when that thing popped off, this raw nerve exposed, because he's chewing on roots and stuff. Uh, that's what he's living on. And it must have hurt like hell, but he, there's no complaint in his journal. He was a stoic, if nothing else. And his journal simply reads, Lost Crown, Climbed Mountain. Now, this is it's, it's resting on a grizzly bear skull. Um, this grizzly bear had been shot by someone way before McCandless's tenure. Um, he found it when he got there, but he left his mark on it. This is his handwriting. All hail the phantom bear, the beast within us all. This is a picture McCandless took after being in a couple months, and you can tell this isn't some angst-ridden suicidal guy who's on a death trip. I don't see that in this picture anyway. I mean, he had some hard days when he first got there. He got pretty hungry. The rice ran out right away, you know, lasted maybe three days. But then eventually, after a week or two, he figured out how to gather plants, forage, how to shoot porcupines and squirrels and birds, and he was fat and happy. I mean, you, look at this picture. The guy's having a good time. But he, he was, a, as I said, he was the kind of kid who thought he knew everything. He didn't take advice well, and he didn't like to do his homework. And he made a, a grave error. Now, it's hot in this picture. It's probably 80 degrees when he took this picture. There's almost 24 hours of daylight at this latitude in the summer. And he's got his shirts rolled, sleeves rolled down, his collar button, because there's really horrendous mosquitoes here. It's not that it's cool. Um, and in this summer heat like this, um, well, I'll go, I'll go into that later. We'll just leave that for now. Um, McCandless, he was doing so well that he decided the challenge wasn't a challenge anymore. It was easy. So he decided he'd accomplish what he set out to do, and he uh, decided it was time to go home. So he packed up his stuff and headed back to civilization. Problem was, um, he didn't know that the heat, in the heat, the rivers come up big time. Um, the river that he'd crossed in, uh, in April was a knee-deep trickle when he crossed it, because it was just after breakup, and it was still really cold. And now that same river was 
you know, this big raging river. Um, it's like the upper Colorado or the middle Colorado. This is rapids, ice, icy glacier melt. It would have been suicidal to try to cross it. So he did the smart thing. He, um, he didn't try to cross it. He returned to the bus and to wait for the river to go down. He was prepared to wait three, four months, whatever it took. It was a smart thing to do. Now, um, much of what we know about McCandless is from these paperback books, that he, these dozen books. Um, his sister got them back, and I read them. And he, he scribbled all these margin notes, which are pretty interesting. And he took five or six rolls of film, and that was interesting. But the most important thing was this journal. This is his whole journal, a little more than a page in, a book, in the back of a book of edible plants. And you can tell he was preoccupied, like anyone living off the land, food is his main concern. So mostly his whole journal is a catalog of the food he's killing and gathering. Day 37, another porcupine, four squirrel, two graybird, ash bird, a third porcupine, squirrel, graybird, goose. That's his journal. But some of the entries are more interesting if you read through the, they're cryptic and telegraphic, but there's stuff behind the basic stuff. And day 43, moose. He shot a moose, which is like hitting the jackpot for a guy living off the land. Hundreds of pounds of meat. All of a sudden, he's in Fat City. And the problem was, um, he didn't know how to preserve it. In, in South Dakota, before coming up here, hunters had told him, the way you preserve your game is you smoke it. And that's great in South Dakota if you have a smoker and the whole rig. But he didn't have any of that. So he tried to smoke, but he tried to improvise. And in the heat, uh, the meat started to go bad right away. It got blown with flies, spoiled, maggots. Um, Alaskans know that w the way you preserve game is you cut it into really thin strips, and you build a little rack, and you air dry it. It's foolproof, works great. But he didn't know this, so he tried to smoke it. Bad consequences. Day 48, five days later, maggots already. Smoking appears ineffective. Don't know, looks like disaster. I now wish I'd never shot the moose, one of the greatest tragedies of my life. He was a self-serious guy. He, took, he was melodramatic. He st took stuff way too seriously. But this really bothered him, because in, in his idealism, he thought it was unconscionable. He thought it was completely immoral to kill an animal and then not use, it, use every bit of it for food. And now he's just wasted hundreds of pounds of meat. It's all rotted, and he's had to leave it out for the wolves. And so he got bummed. And you can tell how bummed he was, because for about a week, he didn't even write anything in his journal. He was seriously depressed. Then if you follow his entries, you see he recovers. And he, 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 he remarks upon the books he finished. He finished Thoreau's Walden and, and the Kreutzer Sonata and Family Happiness and, and the